Hello, hello, young, bold, and regal. Hi, guys. Um, I'm taking over. It's a takeover of Young, Bold, and Regal by me. I'm Shanti Lowry. I'm an actress, a dancer, an activist, um, a creator. I'm an artist. And um, Evan, the creator of Young, Bold, and Regal, has asked me to pop on here and, and talk to you guys, entertain you a little, right? It's a, it's a strange world. We need all the entertainment we can get these days. Um, so I'm here to say hello and introduce myself. Um, so Evan is gonna come on in a little bit and do his thing and interview me and ask me some questions. Um, but in the meantime, hi, there he is. In the meantime, if you guys have any questions or if you want me to discuss something in particular, please let me know. I don't have great eyes and so I'm gonna lean forward like this sometimes. Um, but to start with, let me just give a basic introdu introduction. Um, I started off, uh, I was born in Boulder, Colorado, and I started off as a dancer, um, but I always, always, always wanted to be an actor. My mom tells stories of being three or four years old and trying to put on plays for people. Um, it's just, it's who I am. I like to create, I like to entertain. Um, and, uh, you know, it's interesting talking about this now because in the middle of this Black Lives Matter movement, we're starting to talk about the differences between growing up as a white child or a black child or a mixed child or with privilege or without. And my upbringing was, um, I think, unique in a lot of ways. My mother's white, just as white as can be, like, you know, turns red in the sun, lobster red, white girl uh, with real blonde hair. Like, they really do exist. Um, and my dad is, um, he was, he's passed away, um, Cherokee Indian and African American, just beautiful, like very interesting looking. And um, in Hollywood, that makes me a black actress. That's just how our world works. Um, and growing up, that just made me the black kid that everybody knew. Um, I am from Colorado, as I said, and there's just not a lot of people that look different there. Um, at least there weren't when I was growing up. And so acting and dancing and everything was a challenge because you're not necessarily embraced and welcomed when you're different in a lot of uh in a lot of instances and then also to add on top of that socioeconomically um i grew up poor in an affluent area and i think that's an interesting thing to talk about sometimes because i don't think it's harder or um more difficult or anything it's just different you know if you grow up around a lot of other people that are also poor there's a bond there there's um it's just it's different i think i grew up with a lot of shame because not only am i different physically looking the minute i walk into a room everyone knows i'm different but also we were very very poor and like i said there's just there were no poor people around <laughs> it's a very affluent place so because of that, I ended up just getting to do whatever free recreational activities there were. And there were a lot because it was an affluent um, place. And so I started off dancing for free at the rec center as much as I could. It was like um, babysitting for my mom to send me to dance class for free. And, um, but I always wanted to be an actor. And the path to being an actor was much harder because there's just not free training or free programs for for anyone really, but certainly not for kids without money. Um, so a lot of my childhood was struggling to afford the programs that I wanted, to get the books that I wanted to learn about acting or dancing. And I think that that made me who I am in a lot of ways. I mean, I would hope that other people don't have to struggle like that, but maybe that's what made me love it so much and why even with the struggle that continues to happen in people's careers, I still, just love acting and dancing because I feel very honored that I get to do it. That's the truth. I feel very honored that this little girl from Colorado's dream came true. I moved to LA. I'm still here. I'm loving my life and, and I feel very grateful for that. Um, and I don't know if I would feel the same passion if it had been easier. So there's that. Um, but I struggled and I uh, I really wanted to be an actor, but I like as I said, there wasn't a great path for me. So I chose to dance, knowing that the industries are kind of um, mixed together, and that eventually I could move into acting. And um, so I graduated high school very early. Um, my mom is a teacher, and she was always 
teaching me in my in her off time and I ended up taking college courses in like eighth grade and um, so I was done with school when I was 16 but my mom and I felt I was too young to just like move out and be on my own and I didn't really know if like the whole college experience was all I wanted to do so she sent me to performing arts school in Denver, which was like an hour away, and I was driving at this point. And so it was kind of like a mix between being an adult and a kid. Oh, I like that, yeah. People talking about struggle, how you have to experience struggle to really appreciate. I don't know that that's true, but I certainly feel like it's true in my life and in a lot of other people's lives. A lot of artists, um, the ones that we really love and, and just create the most incredible work, it comes from struggle. And so it's hard to say we wish that they didn't have to have that struggle because then they wouldn't be gifting the world with their art. It's a very interesting balance. Um, but so anyway, <clears throat> I went to a performing arts school for um, about six months after graduating, actually. It was very strange. I was really just there for the arts um, and taking minimal other classes. and. It, it was my way of realizing that that's what I wanted to do. It wasn't academics, even though I was sort of on track to, I really wanted to be a doctor or a politician. I don't know, you're a kid, you wanna do all sorts of things. Um, but at the performing arts school, I realized that I wanted to touch people through art for the rest of my life, whatever that meant. So I decided I wasn't gonna do college, which is really interesting because my mom, as I said, is a teacher, she has a PhD, she has, um, my, all my family has master's degrees and PhDs. It's very important, education, and it is very important. But what was interesting is my mom said, listen, if you wanna be an actor or a dancer, you have to educate yourself in that field. And if that's what you wanna do, be the best actor, be the best dancer, work so hard at it, and I will support you with that. Um, and she did, and so I, I chose to be, uh, I chose to move to LA to pursue dancing because I got an agent and I knew that I would be able to then pursue acting through that. Um, and that wasn't easy either. I kind of jumped over the hardest part, which was um, getting that agent. And it happened for me through dancing. I was on a dance circuit competing all the time and a dance agent actually just saw me and, and came up to me and said, I'd love to represent you if you move to LA. And that was kind of the catalyst of like, all right, it's meant to be, I'm gonna do it. Um, and I thought it was gonna be that easy. Like they walked up to me, I have representation. <laughs> It was not that easy. Um, it was a lot of struggle once I got here to LA. I was 17. I was totally alone. I had $2,200 that I, oh, struggled for years to, to um, save for my journey. Um, I had a Honda Accord two-door that tried to kill me all the time. It would, the oh my, so many stories. The seat belts would, they were those automatic seat belts that um, when you open the door, it's supposed to open. Well, when I would open the door, it would like tighten and like try and choke me. <laughs> this car and I did not get along, but it was all I could afford. And I drove my tiny little car and my $2,000 to LA. And I said, I'm not leaving. I'm going to make it work. Um, my car exploded on the freeway. That wasn't fun. Um, and I had people who reached out and saved me. And my, my agent actually reached out and saved me at one point and gave me a job, like called somebody and said, you have to hire this person as a dancer. So there were some really, I had some luck and I had some kind people that, that saved me out here. Um, and that's why I try to give back and talk about my story whenever I can, because I want to be that for somebody. I'm happy to help in any way that I, I can to get people to pursue their dreams um, because what's the point in living otherwise if we're if we were all pursuing our dreams i think we would be a much happier country place world um, and that's not to say that none of us have to go to work or work hard but you can find a way to be pursuing your dreams in your everyday life you really can um, and that's what i try and um, share with people on my page so that's kind of a quick story of how i got here to la um, I ended up being a dancer with NSYNC. Do you guys remember them, JT? I, uh, I danced with NSYNC. I was a Diddy girl. Do you remember those? The Diddy girls. P Diddy had a group of dancers that danced with 112, that, you know, he had all these different things going on. And so he hired like a core group of dancers and I was a Diddy girl. Um, I was a pussycat doll. That's a job that I, a lot of people, some people know me from and then other people have no idea. I was an original member of the Pussycat Dolls when we did the show um, 
uh, in Hollywood at the Roxy. And I actually signed with the recording deal as well, but in the end, um, I wanted to be an actor and that was very important to me and they were basically doing contracts that said, you know, we own you for this time, for this period and I wasn't really down for that. So I love the Pussycat Dolls and I'm so happy for their success um, and it was an incredible time in my life actually. It was really, it was really special. We had a great time. Um, let's see, what else did I do as a dancer? Uh, I did like the Billboard Awards, the MTV Movie Awards. I did a lot of fun stuff. I did the Super Bowl the year that Janet Jackson. What about that, y'all? What about that? Um, not going to talk about that. I love Janet. I love JT. I'm not going to talk about it. Uh, so anyway, I've, I, I did a lot of dancing. And then I had my really big break. I mean, throughout that whole time, I was training. I was going out on auditions. I was trying to, to become an actor. Um, and then I had a big break on a little show called The Game. The Game on the CW, actually, before it was on, B on BET. Um, and Mara Akil changed my life. I walked into that audition to audition for a one-time uh, guest star and uh, ended up playing Dion for three years and then also coming back on season on the last season of the show. So... That was really when everything changed. When I booked the game, I stopped taking a ton of, um, guys, we get a real interview here. Mr. Bowtie Bandit himself. Let's see, I, we're gonna see if I'm good at this. I've, I've never done this before, so. <laughs> hey there guys. There it is, Holly. <laughs> I, want, I want to introduce, <laughs> how's it going? I, love, I, I didn't want to interrupt, but. I, I know, so... I just started talking and I was like, I don't even know if anyone cares about this, but yes, here we every, go. Yes, every, everybody, <laughs> everybody should care. <laughs> everybody should care. Everybody's journeys matter and make them who they are. So um, to introduce right. everybody on my end, hey, what's up, what's up, Jason? You asked a great question earlier. I'll, I'll ask it again. Um, to introduce uh, myself, I'm the CEO of Young, Bold, and Regal. Introduce Shanti Lowry. She's an amazing uh, professional dancer actress, overall artist. That's what I call people when they do something yes. they're passionate and they love. And how I got to meet her is that back in the day when I started Young, Bold and Regal, when I used to do print work for for my online website, maybe I should have done more video, but that's neither here nor there, right? Yeah. Print, <laughs> print do, you, do you guys remember that? Physical copies? <laughs> um, uh, I emailed her and she was totally on board with what Young, Bold, and Regal is about, is about. And that was very early on. That might have been like four or five years ago, right? Yeah, easily, easily. Yeah. yeah. And then we followed up. <laughs> and then we followed up with a video interview finally. That did pretty great. And then um, now we're here. <laughs> and now we're here telling stories. That was kind of random and fun to talk about how I got here mm -hmm. because you know you don't at, at some point you just drop all of that and you're just this person who lives here you're this actor you know Hollywood's my home I know where yeah. everything is I'm not scared of anything mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you look back and you're like wow you know I was that person who didn't know if I was gonna make it who didn't know if I could do it who was scared of everything you know mm -hmm. it's it's interesting it's it's fun to look back we should all do it more often yeah and like that's what I like when it comes to interviewing, I like interviewing you and other people because I get to show people, look at the work you've done. <laughs> For yeah. all, all, all respective purposes, it's not a normal path. It's not cut and dry. Uh, Nothing about it is normal or regular. And um, of course, I've been a fan of yours since the game and since before. But I remember t asking you uh, in our previous interviews, just about how how do you take command of the physical performance of the acting and that's where you open up and you talk to me about your professional dance career as well yeah, yeah. oh so, dance um, is, is huge and important to me as an actor because being a person is about physicality i don't uh -huh. know if anyone else has ever watched people walk but you should do it you should watch people walk and then try and literally walk like that person walk in their shoes <laughs> And it's so fascinating whether people, you know, walk with their chest up and they're always looking up this way, whether mm -hmm. someone's a little bit more like this, whether, you know, someone has a stride like this. It, it tells you so much about a person 
And it tells you a lot about a character too, to become them physically. Um, and so I really think dance and acting are like that. Exactly. I wanted, I wanted you to continue the story and I wanted to get in your frame yeah. of mind. When you got that role on the game, what did you know going into it? And in retrospect throughout the years, how do you feel not only about the role, but what fans tell you about that role? That's a fascinating one with Dion especially, because I loved Dion. I thought she was a professional. She was like this badass bitch who was like, yeah. but not in a bad way, you know? Uh -huh. Like, I'm gonna, J-Lo, that's what I thought. She was J-Lo. She's gonna handle her, her ish. Um, yeah. She, you know, no one's gonna tell her what's what because she already knows, you know? Mm -hmm. She actually already knows. She's not just someone who thinks she knows, she's on top of it. So that's who I thought Dion was. And I was so excited to play that, you know, just in the yeah. hand. And I walked into the room with Mara and Salim. Mara is the creator and writer. Uh -huh. Salim was her, uh, is her husband and was the director. So he was uh -huh. sitting in. Um, and then like 15 other people. It was a really big casting wow. um, as far as who was in the room executives. So uh -huh. I was very nervous. And I walked in and I just looked at Mara because she's the one I was talking to and reading with. And I was like, I'm going to business the heck out of this woman. <laughs> That's it, right? And then I, uh -huh. and then because they were casting so fast, they actually kept us all together. There were about 20 people testing for the part. And um, they kept us all there. And you're, you know, just looking at this room full of gorgeous, could not be more stunning women who are like, have their crap together. Uh -huh. Once I got the, the job, Mara told me it was fascinating that it wasn't even a question that I had the job hands down when I walked in because wow. every other girl walked in and flirted and, oh, <laughs> and, oh, you know, <laughs> and I was like, I don't have uh -huh. time for that. And I'm here for business. Everybody go to YouTube after this interview and watch that opening scene because uh -huh. that is like, textbook 101 acting 101 she took what was on the script and she amplified it and that's why mara chose her so if you're an actor in here if you're a creative like jason is right you have to take what's on the script right take direction from the director but also live in that character and as other actors would, would say not judge that character but how would step into the psychology of that actor Absolutely. And I just read a comment, would I be interested in more scripted work? Absolutely. I'm on a scripted show right now that I'm actually nominated for an Emmy. The second yes, time. yes. Please, please um, think about that as well. Well, I, but mostly just to say I love scripted TV. I, uh -huh. I love creating. I just like telling stories. If it's a good character, I'm in. You know, good or good character, meaty role, whether it's good or bad. Uh -huh. To me, that's so interesting to bring that to life and tell that story. Um, I, I just love it. And Dion was never bad to me. She wasn't even like, I never <laughs> even got, so many people thought she was a capital bitch, like capital yeah. bitch, you know? And I was like, really? She just kind of knows what she wants and she doesn't take flack. Uh -huh. And she like, you know, yes, she definitely was like to the nines all the time. Even like on a treadmill, she had lashes on, which is a lot. But other than that, <laughs> she was just, we, you know, we need, like we, she knew we, what she wanted. We need an official or maybe an unofficial spinoff because yes. you are <laughs> you I agree. all Dion would have been so fascinating to follow. I don't know why they weren't as in love with Dion as I was. I mean, there were just a lot of characters. <laughs> I, I, I like that they brought your character oh, in. one second. If anyone wants to connect with me, please. I am so yeah. very approachable and attainable on Instagram. Shanti Lowry reach out, message me. And sometimes it takes me like a week to get back to people, but I do get back <laughs> to people. So reach out. Anyway, go ahead. So um, speaking about your, your, your two time Emmy nominations, yeah. um, how did you feel about that? Because I know with my work, I call things like affirmations, not confirmations, meaning that it's not confirmed that I am, you know, the best interview in the world <laughs> because I did one interview but it's an affirmation of all the work I've done before that led me up to that point. I don't think it could be said better than that. That's like perfect. So season one, this is this was a new show. It's called Bronx SIU. It is um, Bronx as in the city and then special investigations unit. Uh -huh. So I play a detective um, who's solving, you know, the worst of the worst, an SIU or an SVU kind of spinoff vibe, except uh -huh. 
that this is far more about the detectives and what they go through in their personal lives and who they really are. Like, we don't just show up to solve a case. We have our whole own backstory. We have addictions. We have, which is so important to be talking about now when we talk yes. about cops. I'm, I'm an activist as well. And I certainly think that we need to be talking about what police are doing. And so uh -huh. playing a cop, is very interesting, but I, I'm very honored because I feel like our show was honest. We never uh -huh. walked around and said, I'm a cop, I'm a superhero. And I'm yeah, it's, it's, right. it's very raw. <laughs> it's very raw, it's real. Uh -huh. We are people, we make mistakes, um, we break rules, we bend, we bend laws. Um, and my character in particular is very flawed. She has a lot of addiction issues, but uh -huh. she wants to be a good person and help her community. So anyway, the show is, is amazing to get to be a part of because it's such a strong um, statement and it's such a strong character and then season one out of nowhere i got nominated for an Emmy, yeah <laughs> and that is exactly right when you said an affirmation that's what it was i the win was getting the job and the, uh -huh. the second win was that we got another season and i got to dig into more of yolanda but that affirmation that you did a good job Keep doing that. Keep working uh -huh. hard. Keep putting in that effort because it, it, it did, a, you know, you did right. Uh -huh. That was amazing. And okay. then this year to get it again was like. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I remember I, I texted you that morning, too, because I was doing coverage on it. You told me. <laughs> I didn't even know. Yeah. You told me. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I, I think what's important about that, too, is a lot of people at, probably ask you, other actresses, other creatives, even myself as a creative, what's the next level? And sometimes you want to tell people, I'm respecting the level I'm at and right. I am doing what I've been doing to get to the next level on uh, my own or with my team. And it's a, it's a process combined with, like you said, you felt out of nowhere, you earned that, that, that nomination. Yeah. I think it was special because we weren't looking for it either. I think that's mm -hmm. only when it, like, if you're searching for that affirmation or that um, validation, it's not the same. When you're yeah. just out there working hard <laughs> and going, hey, I'm happy to be here, and then out of the blue, something comes like that, it's really special. Um, please go and watch Bronx, guys. There's two seasons. We're trying to get a, a third season going, but COVID is, you know, yeah, it's it is changing shutting everything down a lot of for things. everybody. Uh -huh. Yeah. How, how have you how have you kept your your sanity your peace irregardless of career how have kept have you kept yourself um whole and intact during the, uh, this crisis well dance has helped a lot i get to dance at home i i just finished um my in-house little studio space right before coronavirus so somebody was looking out for me yeah um, you know i dance and and take my mind off of things but I, it's interesting because you know how you were saying, what's the next level? What's the next thing? As creators, we are constantly like, the day I was at the Emmys in my gown, like at the Emmys. I'm yeah. Like, what's next? <laughs> Where am I going? What am I doing tomorrow? Yeah. And it's, coronavirus has made us go, no, no, it's Slow today. It down. It's, yeah. what are you doing today? What, you know, it's, what are you doing this 15 minutes? Because I don't have as many calls and auditions and meetings and, uh -huh. you know, there's still stuff happening, but it's not at the same level. And then also the stuff that's happening is all just waiting. Like, okay, well, whenever this, you know, whenever we're ready, we're going to do that. Yeah. Then, <laughs> whenever people can go out again, we'll do that project. Yeah. So it makes you find out who you are besides your work, right? Uh -huh. who, is, who is Shanti not... Yolanda, not Dion, not any of those things, not even the business person out there trying to get a job. Who do I like to be? Uh -huh. And it turns out I love gardening. I love painting. I love dancing. Um, obviously, the Black Lives Matter movement came at a time that was really poignant because a lot of us uh -huh. are sitting at home trying to figure out how to fill our days. Yeah. And so as an activist, that has taken up a lot of my time. Uh -huh. um, I think there's a lot we can do sitting at home, actually. Uh -huh. Speak speak more about that because you, you utilize your, your platform, uh -huh. your your voice to speak on Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, all of the countless other names, not only of this year, but in the past. You, you've amplified your voice about defunding the police, taking time out of your day to educate people, educate yourself, pass that along. Um, what 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 inspired you throughout your not now but throughout your life to be an activist? 
That's so easy. Um, I started talking about it in the beginning. I grew up poor and being the only brown person, let alone black person that I'd ever seen. And that's just, I literally met my first other black person when I was in third grade. Wow. Um, so I was always the underdog. I was always the unseen. I was always different and other. And um, mm -hmm. also my brother who looks like me um, in that town at 12 years old was arrested wow. for holding a BB gun. Wow. Um, this has been happening forever. He was 12. He, and when he was 12, I have to explain this because people can look differently when they're 12. He's five years older than me. Mm -hmm. I was seven. I was taller than him. He was, wow. he was the kind of child who sprouted when he was like 17 or 18. Mm -hmm. He was this tiny, skinny, couldn't bother a fly kid that the cops decided to harass and make an example of. And I remember that my brother was not the same after that. He wasn't a mm. sweet kid. He wasn't, and that's wrong. And I'm not gonna get too upset. Like I normally I'm so passionate and I'm just trying yeah. to stay cool and say, mm -hmm. that's wrong. And if we don't take this time to let people know the, all the stories that we've been saving up and kind of just kind of getting by with, right? Mm -hmm. Black people aren't out there telling you all of our stories. I got yeah. over for a broken tail light on a brand new fucking car. Brand mm -hmm. new. And they harassed me for 15 minutes, oh. made me scared, made me feel bad about myself, made me late to where I was going. That's illegal. That's not, that's not George Floyd. That's not a big deal. That's illegal. That was mm -hmm. a year ago, right? Wow. Then all these stories, you know, I was, I was harassed on an airplane and made to move because someone didn't want to sit next to me. Like, and if these stories happen to me, mm -hmm. just think of how many other people have stories. And so it just didn't feel right for me to sit here in my cozy house after I struggled and now I've made it and go, well, good luck to you. I hope you make it too. Mm -hmm. That's not right. I have to, I have to try and help and make a difference. And I have the platform. I have some experience that I can share. Mm -hmm. I, I feel the magnitude of the situation. And I also feel that we are at the exact right place for everybody to yeah. stand up and speak because we can make a difference if we do it now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, exactly. As, yeah. And as uh, far as defund the police, let me just be clear about my stance. Yeah. I've had, I've had some really heated conversations with people who disagree mm -hmm. and I want them to understand a couple of things. No one is saying, well, no, I am not saying that all police are bad. Mm -hmm. I am not saying that all police are worthless and that they have, you know, that they should not exist and that their lives have been meaningless. What I'm saying is the institution was founded on something that was, was called slave catching. It was a slave patrol. It was founded on something that is morally not right anymore. Mm -hmm. It was also, it is, it takes up way too much money because we think everything is a police problem. If anything happens anywhere and we can't solve it, we say hire more police officers and have them go deal with it. And that's mm -hmm. not solving a problem. That's exactly. creating a problem. And then the biggest thing is many countries do not have police officers carrying guns around all over all the time. It's certain officers who are highly trained. They're trained in when to use the gun and when and how not to use it, how to de-escalate. Um, those people can carry guns. But a traffic officer, the guy who pulled me over to harass me for a fake taillight that's broken, he didn't need to have a gun. That was mm -hmm. just to scare me. That was just to be a bully. Mm -hmm. And so my opinion is we need more streets. We need our streets fixed. We need more teachers. We need nurses in schools. We need textbooks in schools. We need, there are so many things that our cities are supposed to fund, but instead in LA, 52% of our budget goes to police. Yeah. In most big cities, it's like 30%. That's just too high. So mm -hmm. no one's saying all police officers should get lost or whatever, but we need real reform. We, and, and that does mean, unfortunately, no more police unions. That mm -hmm. means not, you know, because the police unions are protecting and doing a lot of the damage. And the only way to get rid of it is to get rid of that union. So those are my stances in case anyone wants to talk to me yes. about more. <laughs> that's where I stand. Yeah. And I, I want you to talk about that as well. What, what has been the feedback of you utilizing your your voice, either negative or positive, or something that surprised you. Um, yeah, both. Uh, mostly positive. 
because those are the people who reach out to me. I think yeah. because I'm a generally positive person, so mm -hmm. people don't generally attack. But what I have noticed is people that I thought were, we were very close, all of a sudden we're not talking anymore. And yeah. they're on their page <laughs> and they don't have anything about anything. And they're posting mm -hmm. their dog. And, it, you know, it's not to say your page should be littered with the same things mine are. But mm -hmm. if you live in this world and you believe that Black Lives Matter and you believe that the coronavirus is real, I think that somewhere on your social media platform, it would say that. Uh -huh. And so I have noticed that it kind of, it's, it's, I have not, I've only experienced a couple of personal, like, I can't talk to you anymore. We don't see eye to eye. This is not going to yep. work. Uh -huh. Mostly it's just me realizing that people aren't necessarily who you think they are. And that's hard. And I'm yeah. sure people are realizing that about me. <laughs> yeah. It, you know? I think in both in instances, the, the perception is, um, is deceived based off of the real times we are in. If somebody says something you don't agree with, sometimes people's gut reaction is to react a certain way. But if the consensus agrees that black lives matter, which everybody should agree with that, um, there should be no rebuttal for that. How is um, there a rebuttal? Like we are really getting into <laughs> nonsense. Like I mm. honestly believe that in, I don't know how many years, because I don't know how long people are gonna be this stupid. But let's say 50 years, <laughs> there's going to be a textbook that's written about how really it was just the racist people who were like, but all lives matter because we can't say black life. It's, it's really going to be that black and white. If you uh -huh. can't say black lives matter, it's not a scary movement. It's not it, all this talk about Antifa and all this stuff. You are literally just brushing over the point that all we're trying to say is if we're black, that does not mean that you get to treat us differently. Our uh -huh. life also matters. And that uh -huh. should not be a difficult thing to say. It's shocking when it is. And I think, yeah. that, honestly, it should tell you everything you need to know about a person. If in this day, after all the stuff that's been online and after how many people have tried to explain the movement, if they still have a problem with it, move along. You don't need to talk to them. They're not yeah. going <laughs> to They're not going to do it. Yeah, and I feel like over the years, you've done a great job with that. I remember you did a film a few years back. There was some troll on Twitter, and you shut him down, like, completely. <laughs> Open up a little bit about that. Not necessarily focusing on the troll, but how you react to uh, people right. who say crazy things when they have an egg on their profile. <laughs> right? Right. I don't know if I, I think that's funny that you say that you love that. I hate that story. I wish I hadn't responded. Mm. So somebody just said something. I played a, a prostitute in a movie. Mm -hmm. and they said, you know, how dare you? Because black people are always portrayed like that. And, you know, honestly, I get that. That's true. We're, we're talking about that stuff right now, how black women want to play parts like Dion, you know, mm -hmm. just business woman. We don't always want to be the crack hoe. But um, at the same time, there are important roles that are in meaty, beautiful movies where you bring art and life to a character, and that's beautiful too. And so this guy was saying stuff, and I, I just said, excuse me, you don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. My mother is the one, because he said something like, my mom would be ashamed of me. And I was like, my mom was at the premiere with me. She was holding <laughs> my hand. She was like, high five. Um, <laughs> But I'm disappointed in myself that I responded because mm. it didn't matter. He didn't read it and go, oh, you're right. I am yeah. wrong. And so honestly, I should have maybe just said the first part point of, you know what? My mom was at the premiere with me and she thought I did a great job mm. and but, let it go. Yeah, but, but from my perspective, I like that you spoke up and you said that because I feel like sometimes there's people on Twitter or in real life that don't feel comfortable telling those stories. They don't feel comfortable even addressing it. So I like the way that you you gracefully shut shut whoever that whoever that was shut them down. But, right. Um, the, in the Chrissy last Chrissy Teigen is the best at that. If you need, oh to yeah. See, I wish I was she, Chrissy. Every time people say things <laughs> about her, it's like one sentence and she wins. I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> And I want you to talk about that as well. In our last interview, we talked about um, as an actress, having the, the breadth and control of your career choices, sometimes as they come and sometimes as you seek them out. And um, in my opinion, I feel like as an actor, an actor meaning being male or female, it's your duty to play any role 
you're able to play within reason in terms of if you want to play Superman, great. Superman's character and origin has nothing to do with race. He's technically right. an alien, right? right? But if you're Meryl Streep and you say, I want to play, you know, um, like another Harry, Harriet Tubman remake, we all got to collectively be like, Meryl, you're good. No, we, we don't want that. <laughs> So, you know, that's so an interesting line for me, and it's going to be, I'm just being honest. Um, mm -hmm. As an actor, I actually find it, it it's a hard, it's hard to, to know where the line is, because it mm -hmm. seems like it's more of a political and line than anything. Because, for instance, Halle Berry just got trashed for saying that she was interested yeah. in playing a transgendered person. Mm -hmm. And I understand both sides. I understand Halle saying, you know, they need more representation on TV and movie. We need to make a movie about, and I, I as an actor, want to play that part. I want to get into that, and I want to learn about it, and I want to bring it to life. We geek mm -hmm. out on that stuff. As actors, that's fun for us. The harder the character, the more we have to get into it. That's what we want. So on her side, she wasn't trying to be disrespectful. She was mm -hmm. actually trying, I think, to respect them and say, I want to tell your story. And on their side, they were saying, let us tell that story. Mm -hmm. But as actors, it's like, if I'm only allowed to play who I am, that's very, very unique. Limited. I am yeah. white, Cherokee, and black. And what story is about me, you know? Um, and so I, I, I understand all sides of it. And I, I really don't think that there should be another white person playing a Native American in movies. Like, my mm -hmm. gosh, that's enough. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And so, yeah, I guess I, yeah. I, maybe we're at a place where, you know, gay characters should be played by LTB, LGBT people. Or mm -hmm. I, I don't really know because acting is about becoming something you're not. So mm -hmm. I hope I don't step in it ever, but I'm always meaning to do it from a good place. I would love to play a white woman. I would love to play the native that I am. I would love to play the black woman that I am, but I only am a black actor to people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's interesting. Yeah, it's, it's it's very interesting. Speaking about roles, yeah. what would be any future roles? It could be like an archetype, maybe a villain in a superhero series or a superhero franchise, right? Yeah. Um, or or a or a biopic, maybe a, a particular creative you have in mind. You're like, I'd love to play play her or him, right? Since we're talking about you ready, um, it's so good. I would die. Yeah. I would die to do it. <laughs> Lena Horn. Okay. If you want to write Lena Horn's story? It's amazing. Another example of if she was a white man, we would have statues of her. Mm -hmm. There would be buildings named after her, but she was a black woman in the wrong time. And mm -hmm. man, oh man, we need to make a movie about Lena. And I would be honored to to play her. Um, singer, dancer, actor, activist. Um, you know, proud black woman. Just incredible person. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to do that. I actually would love to play Wonder Woman and not in the way that most people think. Um, I created a, when I was young, I was a geek and a nerd and that's fine. <laughs> I, Shout out to the geeks and the nerds out there. there. You we run in the world right now. <laughs> right? Um, and I was obsessed with um, South America because my aunt was an archeologist at the time down there. So wow. she'd send me things and I learned about the real history of the Amazon River uh -huh. and then understanding the Amazon tribe that is in Wonder Woman, where that all comes from and where it all plays. And actually the Amazon River is named after the idea of the Amazon women that isn't real. So anyway, wow. the point is that there were real Amazon women in South America that attacked um, a Spanish armada and decimated actual soldiers and they were all women and they wrote back to Spain like these crazy native women with their boots wow. flying everywhere <laughs> we murdered everyone it's crazy out here and wow. so they renamed the Rio Grande River the Amazon off of these women and I would like to make a movie based on that story that retelling of where the Amazon women could really have come from not ancient Greece and all white you know <laughs> But South America, where they, they were, these tribes were created because Spanish soldiers would go through and kill all of the men and children and rape the women and leave them just the way they were. 
And wow. so groups of these different tribes would come together, just women, and form their own tribe, Amazon Warriors. I mean, it's real. Why aren't we telling that story? That would be a good <laughs> well, movie. Well, well, you and I can tell that story, and okay. particularly you can tell that story. I would love to. I would love to. <laughs> I want you. I want you to tap back into your professional dance career. How do you want to explore that in in your career, either in roles as you as the the main actress, maybe the producer, maybe the director? Um, how do you want to go about it going forward? You know, I had the opportunity to create whatever show I wanted about that because someone said, hey, listen, there should be more dance, you know, on TV, create a show. So the show that I created and, and, and shot and love um, is called Stuck Together. And it's about a family that it's just a family sitcom at the end of the day, but it's the matriarch of the family, me has uh -huh. to find a way to support her family with her dance career. At first she was a socialite and everything's fine and they lose everything in the blink of an eye. And they, and the only skill that this woman has is dance, you know? She has a lot of my history as far as dancing with the Pussycat Dolls and Diddy and all that. So she was a really highly trained professional dancer who got married and then just became a housewife. So now that all that's gone, you know, how does she support herself? And I loved the idea of this show because I am a professionally trained dancer in almost all forms of dance. And I do mean all. I've, tap, jazz, ballet, point, um, hip hop. I, mm -hmm. I've, I've done salsa. I've, I've done it professionally on all levels. And so this way I would get to show all of that. You know, I don't just love doing one form of dance or listening to one form of music. Mm -hmm. I love the idea of being able to hear a song and create a dance off of that, however that makes you feel. And so that show is to showcase the dancing abilities that I have. Um, we've shot the pilot. We are shopping it right now. The coronavirus is making this really hard. Um, yeah. but hopefully that show will be coming to you soon. So what, what, we, what we all can do <laughs> yeah. is hope and pray and keep supporting Shanti in her professional, professional dancing career and her acting career. I also wanted to touch on um, <laughs> who has inspired you throughout your career, either fellow peers. Um, you mentioned Lena Horne, of course. You mentioned uh, Mara Braca Keel, who is a... So much. She, to me, she is, she's a genius. She's one of the best, um, you know, modern writers, modern saying like last 20, 25, 30 years. She, is, she has contributed so much to the culture that I feel like people might not even know. I think that is so absolutely accurate. Um, it's funny because I met Mara at a time in my life when I don't think I understood why I was so in love with her and, and why mm -hmm. I was so passionately needing to be near her. But she has that energy. She is, she's a light, you know, she's the kind of person she's, first of all, in case you don't know, she's stunning. She's like mm -hmm. absolutely gorgeous in an almost off-putting way. Like she's so beautiful <laughs> that you can't imagine that she's the one who's going to come in and tell all these men what to do too. So there's that, mm -hmm. but she's just so warm and creative and talented in every way. Like she's a great mother. She's stylish. She's smart. She's well-spoken. She's just the epitome of everything that I knew I was in love with her. But now looking back, the thing that I was most in love with was her command of professionalism and that it never felt like it wasn't gonna happen. She never felt, it never felt like she was a woman just winging it or like she wasn't in control. She owned every aspect of that show. And as a creator who's now shot a show, I know how incredibly hard that is. I don't mm -hmm. have any idea how she was able to make sure that everyone across the board felt loved and cared for and attended, attended to. She's amazing. Mm -hmm. And to remind people as well, Mara Brockakio, creator, uh, main writer of Girlfriends, everybody loves <laughs> the women of Girlfriends. Every storyline I feel is coming, come, has come to life in some woman's life right? in the past 20 years. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the game, of course, being Mary Jane, um, introducing us even further into the amazing Gabrielle Union. Love is. Love and I think is. she just, and a black lightning, of course. So 
I feel like um, she's given us, she's given us so much. <laughs> so much. And as just as one person, like Mara, when she came into this world, she brought all of that with her and it influenced how many people, you know, like one of my best friends I met on the set of the game. Um, and she was just a, a PA at the time. And now, you know, years later, she's doing a million other things and we're really close. But imagine the people who got married and had kids and, you know, she's created lives and she's uh -huh. a beautiful black woman. Let's celebrate them. <laughs> <laughs> Let's celebrate her with, with yeah. all the accolades and, and, and all the love. It's interesting because I recently covered the NAACP Image Awards and some of, one of the reporters asked Angela Bassett when she was in the winner's circle, did she ever feel frustrated that she never got an Oscar nomination for playing uh, uh, Tina Turner or any of her other magnificent roles, right? right. Which well, she did deserve. I look yeah. back on that Oscars and I'm like, no shade, but you can swap that out easily. But we will give <laughs> Angela Bassett all her flowers. But she says it's about the work, essentially. She was like, I don't do it for the accolades. You do it for the accolades, you might always be disappointed. Yeah. But it is always good to get accolades. So we know that at the HAPA Awards, uh, I think it was last year. It was last year. Correct? Yeah. You you received an award. I want you to tell tell that story a bit. Yeah. So I was nominated for the Emmy that year and I didn't win it. And it was the most wonderful experience going to the Emmys, the whole thing. It was wonderful. Um and so when the HAP Awards came, um, same exact group of people that were nominated for the Emmys, you know, that happens. And um, it was actually a really fun, relaxing thing because I'd already been through like the more uptight Emmys and it was wonderful and I didn't mm -hmm. win and it was fine. I survived, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so the HAP Awards were like so chill. I had a dress that I just like had in my closet from a designer and um, my mom was in town and we like got drunk ahead of time and, you know, just like not thinking anything of it. And then I won. And it yeah. was <laughs> like, and it couldn't, it, it was possibly more meaningful than an Emmy for this reason. I had not been aware of the HAP Awards before the um, nomination, but mm -hmm. what it is, is it crosses African talent from Africa and American talent. And so they take the streaming shows and they do like a, an African best actor and then a universal best actor, meaning people in Africans in the United States watch and Africans in Africa watch this, this show. Uh -huh. When best actor universal, meaning that they watch it in Africa, it moved me in a way that was like, it was just surprising. I was standing uh -huh. on the stage and I looked out, it was a sea of the most beautiful brown faces all these really talented black actors and, and artists that I look up to and have paved the way were standing there, had introduced me. And it was like, this is so meaningful because it wasn't, it also wasn't a dream, but it was a dream to feel included and to feel uh -huh. like part of this community that I didn't even know I had and you embraced me. And it was, it was so lovely. It was really special. And that, that that's such a beautiful story because with streaming, you reach so many people and you probably didn't even... No idea. And no idea, comprehend, yeah. know the numbers of like, wait, how many people are watching me? And right. I feel like that was a testament, that was an affirmation of all the work you've done leading up, leading up to that. How did your, how did your, your friends, your loved ones, your family react to that as well? Oh, we were all screaming. We were all yeah. screaming. It was so fun because nobody expected it. It wasn't even a thought, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, this is so fun. Let's just go and have a good time. Um, but, yeah, I mean, everybody wants to take a picture with the award. And, like, yeah. it, it matters even though it doesn't feel like it should. Somehow it does. Where, where do you keep the award? In my office so that I can look at it as I'm inspired to create new stuff i can remember like you're on the right path you know you, you know how to do this don't don't get frustrated <laughs> <laughs> um go, going forward we talked about what type of roles you want to do but going forward what type of movies do you want to do and who would you who, who will you work with because we we're saying will because yeah. you are on that trajectory you are on that path of success that you you paved when you were a child, when you, you paved, when, when you went to the, to the dance classes and all of that. Exactly. Absolutely. That's a great point. 
Um, there's so many great, talented people I'd love to work with. One that stuck with me for a lot of years is Paul Haggis. Uh -huh. um, he did Crash, and I haven't watched it in a long time, so I don't know how the movie holds up, but I remember thinking it was a really incredible project to sit down and write and then shoot at that time in history, because no one else was talking about those things. No one else was talking about how complex being a light-skinned Black person trying to live in a white world might be for someone like Terrence Howard. Um, uh -huh. Uh, I personally think that's what's going on with Terry Crews. He's not a light-skinned man, <laughs> but he's a man who's trying very hard to fit into his white world and yeah. trying to see things through their eyes instead of taking a moment to say, hey, guys, maybe you should look through mine. Or even with Terry, he hasn't been struggling for a very long time. Maybe he needs to look through his younger yeah. eyes. You know, I'm not, mm -hmm. I would never say to Terry as a black man that I know your struggle more than you do. I am not saying that. But maybe, maybe he needs to think back about some of the struggles that he's had and yeah. how that made him feel. Because I do agree, it's a white person and a black person problem. We got to do it together. But bottom line, black people are not being pro or overly pro black by just saying our lives matter. Exactly. It, it, it's not it's not a controversial statement at all. And then speaking about Crash, Dan Danny Newton did a recent article. She talked about how she didn't know what was going to go on in the scene. And Paul Haggis finally explained it to her. She went back in her trailer and she cried. And she said she cried. The, because, the, when he molested her on the car? Yeah, so. because she because she, she's a British actress. And in my opinion of, of British culture is that it's very reserved or it's subdued or some things are very covert or something so overtly happening. She said at the time, she didn't know what the perception would be. But she, she said, knowing now is that that was an important scene because that stuff actually happens. So. It happens, it happens. I wasn't, it wasn't to that degree, but when I was frisked, why was I frisked? I've never done anything wrong in my life. Why have I been pushed up against a wall and frisked? Wow. Maybe my skin tone. Um, Yep, same thing. It got real handsy. And I'm like, I'm not sure what you think I'm hiding up there other than you're just molesting me. Um, no, it's interesting because that that scene to me is why that movie was so pivotal. He told a story when no one else was really talking about that. And that is, and then also the way that he twisted it to, here's a cop who's having a bad life. He's unhappy with his own life. And so he's taking out that rage and feeling of inadequacy, he's using his power uh -huh. to, you know, to, to make himself feel better on this woman, right? But then later when she, he's, he also decided to be a cop because he actually wanted to help people apparently. And so when he's actually trying to do his job and do the right thing and help her, she's terrified of him. Uh -huh. Hello, that is where we are right now. That is where we are. All of these good cops that are like, why are people saying, cops are bad and why aren't people you know treating us with respect every time you looked the other way when somebody did something like that you made it so we don't trust you we're scared of you i'm terrified of police terrified huh. the other day there was just a tree that had fallen over and there were all these cop cars around it and there was a cop with his hands on his hips and his guns right there and he's telling people really you know angrily which way to go and i just thought huh. what is going on like a tree fell in the road. Nobody's going to drive through the tree. You don't have to stand there with your gun yelling at people. Someone could politely wave people the other way. I just think our society has gone real crazy with police. Mm. And I think that's what Paul was trying to say is that you can't say you're going to protect people and then also abuse them and think that they're going to, you know, want your help. Mm -hmm. it, and it's, it's, I feel like it's tantamount to like living a double life. Yes. You know, and yes. we, you know, for, for those who are secure yeah. with our lives, with our black lives, we don't want to keep put it in the hands of cops who are unsure about saving us or not. We'll, we'll, yes. we'll save ourselves. Yes. Or maybe just putting in the hands of people who are going through trauma. I think the uh -huh. other thing that Paul Haggis did really well is he showed that that cop isn't just a racist asshole. He, it comes from somewhere. Like, he is a racist asshole. But it comes from his own life, his own struggle, his own really difficult time that he's going through. But the bottom line with that is, that's why they shouldn't be allowed to just have guns and immunity because uh -huh. they're people and they have bad days. 
So there needs to be way more laws about when they can use them, when they should have them, period. And then there needs to be actual accountability. I saw this great tweet about um, why people uh, in like, in other businesses know how to de-escalate a situation. And the example was in a Costco, there was a, um, a man who wasn't wearing a mask and the Costco employee was very calm and he just kept getting in his way and not ever pushing him or hurting him, but just wouldn't let him go. And someone was like, why is it that police can't de-escalate a situation like that? And the commenter said, because they won't lose their jobs. And it's so mm -hmm. true. If that Costco employee had smacked the person, even though they were wrong, you're fired. A cop doesn't lose his job when he breaks the law, he mm. or she. And that is where we are. That's why we have these problems. Mm. Wow, that was, that, was, that, was, that was very well said. Thank you. Yeah. Um, in, in, the, in the closing, uh, the, the closing of this, this interview slash takeover, <laughs> what, do you want, what do you want people to know about your career as far as a message? What's the overall message of your career? And before you answer that, um, I believe the, the <laughs> I, I love your work, of course, but I believe the message of your, of your work is to keep going and it's an ongoing process. Yeah. And I feel like people like to quantify what is, what is success, what isn't success, but you have to define it for yourself and then you have to go out and get it and it should be outcome independent, meaning that if it's a yes or a no, that's not going to change your, your successful. It's not one day you're successful, one day you're not. Right. So, you know, this might be a good example. I watched this show called Alone um, on Netflix and on, oh, yeah. on Prime. It's mm -hmm. awesome. Great show. In order to survive, they have to do a lot of things. They have to build a, a house. They need fire. They need food. They need water. Um, and they go out and they fish and maybe they've been fishing for two days and they bring nothing back, but that's not failing. Failing is quitting and going home. They have an option to like call and leave if they want. Right. Huh. Um, and so I feel like that's this industry too. Like I think a lot of people think success is only when you catch the fish or you kill the bear or you, you know, get your fire success is every single time that you try and you don't quit because how many people move home and quit and don't do it. And, and also, part of the job is the auditioning. So if you uh -huh. hate auditioning, then you hate your job. I don't, <laughs> I don't really love it, but I try. I try and really embrace it. And I try and get excited for each audition because this is what I said I wanted to do. I wanted to find a character, create it, put the time and energy and the work in, and then let it go and see what happens. And it's really hard when you do that. And they're like, oh, cool, <laughs> bye. All that work for nothing. Uh -huh. You know, that's what my husband, he does reports and all sorts of things. And he's sitting there for hours doing a report or something. And he sends it to someone and they're like, nope. Okay, do another mm -hmm. one, you know? So I think that's something that I want people to know about my career. And also just their careers is the only way you are not succeeding is if you're quitting. If you continue to go and show up, you're going to book something. You're going to land something. And that is the success. My career message is definitely that, never, never give up. And also I, I hope that someday my legacy would be to create complex, deep female characters um, that stand alone. That would be the main thing. Wow, I think I, our, our hour might be up, but that was a beautiful ending we have a, a couple fellow actors in here we have savannah Hi. williams she's agreeing 100 percent <laughs> we have april hale who's a who's a great actor and these are actresses that i personally know and i'm loving that you're telling this story because when people act me ask me about actors yeah. actresses or whatever i point them towards your career <laughs> i say That's this crazy. is like this is the type of career that would be really great because she has such range, not only in her performances, but her career choices. And um, everybody's path is different, but as a role model for an actor, as far as um, doing it 100%, I feel like you're doing it. Kevin, thank you. Thank you for <laughs> everything. Thank you for being the person to call me and tell me about the Emmy nomination. Yeah. Oh <laughs> thank you for supporting 
all sorts of actors throughout the years, me in particular, but um, it's important to support each other, to support magazines like yours, online magazines, all of it, yeah. you know? I appreciate you. <laughs>